Rightio, good afternoon everybody. My name's Ripley Atkinson. I'm the National Livestock Reporting Service Manager for Meat and Livestock Australia. So today I'm going to give you guys an update on the sheep and cattle markets and what the outlook is after a fairly tumultuous 2023 and what's actually driving this current dynamic and why we're seeing prices anywhere between 15 and 50% below 10 year averages. So my role within MLA, I've been in the markets team for three years, is to look at this data, analyse it, understand it, and then put it into some context for people like yourselves to, um, to sort of make sense of it all. And it has been a challenging year, and I think that's the first thing we all need to recognise and appreciate. Um, but there are some positives on the horizon, and things will turn around. And we know this, this industry and this sector is cyclical. We've been here before, and, and we'll do it again. Jason, this morning mentioned or referenced confidence as something that's quite important. And I think Jason made a really valid point, which we as a, as a team and MLA have sort of recognised for some time, is how significant confidence, how significant a role confidence can play in influencing why these prices are behaving the way they are. And when you take confidence out of a market, particularly the producers, you remove you remove a buyer, essentially. And that's, in simple macroeconomics terms, is reducing demand. And when supply is high and you combine those factors, that's a clear indication of why you're seeing, or, or a clear indication and factor onto why we're seeing prices behave they are. So I'll jump straight into it. I'm going to start with sheep first, and we're going to have a look at what's driving the market, um, where supply is at, and some really recent data that we're going to publish on the website this afternoon which surveys 1,700 sheep producers across the country and just have a look at confidence and what's, how that's changed within the space of 12 months. And then from the producers themselves, what they expect uh, input prices, wool prices and land prices to do within the next 12 months. So you'll see here I've highlighted or, or um, suggested five key factors which I think are quite influential on, on what's driving this market at the minute. So firstly, supply is obviously a key indication of, of where we're at. So the sheep flock is at 78.75 million head, the highest it's been since 2007. And for those of you that remember, that's basically the highest it's been since the reserve wool price scheme was removed. Um, so it's the highest, what we're calling it is, it's the highest the flock's been in the modern era which is quite significant, um, higher even than 2014. And uh, the breeding ewe numbers across the country in April were at their highest level since 2007 as well. And lamb numbers this October will be the highest they've been since 2005. So already supply is a key indication or key factor here as to, to how significant this, herd, uh, this flock rebuild's been, sorry, since 2020. The flock's grown from 64 million or 100 year low to a 15 year high within the space of three years. It's lifted by about 23 or 24 million head. Uh, sorry, 14 or 15 million head from 64 to 79. Second thing, we all are aware of it and I'll touch on how much lower prices are than 10 year averages in a moment, but this market's fallen further and faster than anyone expected. I think if we all tried to tell ourselves we knew where it'd be at this moment right now, considering we've actually had a pretty good month and it's picked up, no one could have suggested that prices could get to where they are at the minute. The next thing, which is really quite a big factor as well, is in the face of some sort of intense media scrutiny on El Nino, weather conditions that generally haven't really eventuated, producers began offloading stock which probably shouldn't have been sold simply because they weren't finished or ready. They didn't have adequate fat cover in their lambs. They weren't at at a presentable weight or quality to go to market. And that mixed quality in the face of high supply is giving buyers the choice and the opportunity to determine and dictate what they pick out of those sales. And because of that, that's reducing demand across the general market. Last two points are more further down the supply chain. We'll have record land production this year. We'll have record land slaughter this year and mutton production and mutton slaughter. Mutton slaughter, for example, will lift by over two, two and a half million head within the space of 12 months. So production volumes are very, very strong at the minute and they will be this year and they will be next year. And then when we take a step further than that, 0.5, talking about the export markets and, and domestic consumption, 
Domestic consumption for lamb is the strongest it's been since 2016 at the minute at an aggregated level, not per capita, but at an aggregated level. So domestic consumption is really good. Where the, where the past four weeks, compared, or the four weeks just gone compared to the past four weeks last year, our lamb consumption through retail markets has increased 10%. So the price has come down 13% for those corresponding four weeks 12 months ago, and that's directly translating into increased consumer or consumption of lamb. In the export markets, because we're producing a record amount of lamb, we're also exporting record volumes. And basically every month this year, lamb exports have cracked records consecutively. So mutton exports as well, not records, but performing very strongly. That's just a brief snapshot of where we're at at the minute. As I mentioned, breeding ewes the highest since 2007. Um, flock the highest since 2007 as well. Prices, as I mentioned, down between anywhere between 40 and 70% on last year. Um, and as, as I sort of touched on already, that confidence factor is a major contributor to what we're seeing. When you reduce confidence from buyers or producers' confidence is low because of how badly burnt some got during the drought and the concerns of that drought between 17 and 19, people don't want to step back into the market anymore. They're too worried about what that drought did to them and the media attention on this El Nino, which for most of us hasn't eventuated to that extent, is the clear indication of why we're seeing prices like they are. So the market's lower than where it was in 2019 when we all know the seasonal conditions across the board were significantly worse than how we're at, where we're at at the minute in terms of season. And that's the way I'm describing to people. That's the way you can describe the difference in price. So prices are lower than what they were in 2019, but our seasonal conditions are not as bad. So the difference can be explained by that confidence factor that's been drawn away from the market or out of the market, which is taking the producer away from buying. And when you take a producer away from buying, that reduces that demand and that competition between buyers, your processes, your, your store lamb fatteners, things like that. When you take that out, it naturally places downward pressure on price. And that's why we're seeing the market where it's at at the minute. This was that survey I was talking about. We're going to release it this afternoon, hopefully. It's done, was well, surveyed, it's captured over 1,700 sheep producers across the country in every state by the territory. This slide, on the left you've got wool sentiment, on the right you've got sheep sentiment. The way it's measured is, the sim it's a simple question, how do you feel about uh, the industry over the next 12 months? Very positive, positive, neutral, negative, very negative. And you divide or you subtract the positive from the negative to get you that figure. This time last year for, for sheep meat or sheep and lamb producers, we were positive 67. So we were right up there, you know, 33 points off 100. It goes between positive 100 and negative 100. This survey, which went out in October, we've fallen 109 percentage points in the space of 12 months, which gives you an indication of how substantial, particularly in the sheep meat space that I'm focusing on at the minute, how substantial the reduction in confidence has been in a simple metric like that. And the next one... I wanted to touch on is we asked the producer how they feel about the next 12 months. Input prices, wool prices, sheep meat prices. You'll see it's a mix across the board. So there's still that understanding and belief from producers that input prices are going to continue to increase. But there's a mixed view when you look at the sheep meat prices, for example, of what that looks like. Wool, the wool producers are less optimistic, but you can see the sheep and lamb producers, they have a bit more positivity in the sense that they're expecting prices to improve, which I think is a good thing to highlight. And this is not MLA suggesting prices are gonna rise. This is coming from the horse's mouth in the sense that the producers believe things are gonna get better, which I think is a good thing to, to keep an eye on. And I'd encourage any of you that do have the time when we put this uh, survey report online to go and have a good read at it, because it, it's giving you data and insights from the producers themselves. It's not, it's not MLA suggesting what's going to happen or how they're feeling. It's directly from the producer. And I wanted to make point of this confidence um, slide or screenshot, whatever you'd like to call it, because of how significant that reduction has been and what that's doing to why we're seeing prices behave the way they are. So 
that fall in confidence really can't be understated as to how significant it sucked demand out of the market from, from the producer end and what that in turn has done to pressure prices. I'll jump in now to what our forecasts are. These, this data set um, or this, these forecasts were released in July this year and we'll have a fresh update in February where we'll run a webinar for an hour that'll cover all this content. So keep an eye out for that through the MLA channels. But as I mentioned, the sheep flocked to its highest level in 15 years. This year for lamb slaughter, as a result of that, and the changing sort of focus and, and flock profile moving towards a, a, a lamb production focus, we're going to break records this year for lamb slaughter, higher than 2016 um, and, and higher than 2014 as well. So lamb slaughter this year, um, that's saying 22.5. It'll probably be closer to 23 to 24 million. Last year, we killed 21 and a half million. So within the space of two years, there's a, uh, sorry, the space of 12 months, there's the potential for lamb slaughter to increase anywhere between two to two and a half million head, which shows you how significant the supply rise has been. As I said, production volumes forecast to probably break 550,000 tonnes. The previous record was last year, which was 530, and the record before that was 16, which was 500,000. So high carcass weights are a key contributing factor, but obviously high numbers are, are influencing that as well. And lastly, prices. When you consider that the lamb crop is the biggest it's been since 2005, looking forwards in price terms, what's been really positive is the last four weeks, the market's lifted considerably, um, and that's been driven by some confidence coming back in from the rain, which shows you how influential that can be. The last month, you know, basically widespread from, you know, Roma right down to, to southern Victoria in the eastern seaboard and parts of WA as well, we've gotten some rain. And it shows you how quickly the market can turn around. But for the time being, we are expecting prices to remain sort of subdued. And when you look at where prices are at the minute compared to, pardon me, um, that one, compared to 10-year averages, we are expecting prices to lift, but they've still got a, they've got a way to go before we even get back to 10-year averages. So there is upside, there's more upside than downside, but it will take some time. And um, at the minute, that high supply of new season lambs or suckers coming through at the minute, we had 55,000 lambs at Hamilton yesterday, is an example of that high supply we expect to sort of keep a lid or keep pressure on, on price. This is the um, July forecast for lamb slaughter, and you'll see it's sort of gradually improving. This was what we put out in July, but volumes have continued to exceed what we expected they could. So in the last week of October, we killed 479,000 lambs. That was the highest since December 2016. In early November, Victoria killed nearly 250,000 lambs. That was the highest figure on record. So processes are coping with these numbers but we do expect supply to continue and that chart out to 2025 is an indication of what we expect supply to do moving forwards because of the number of breeding users is still very high historically even though it's coming down we're going to continue to produce more lambs and with the investment producers have made in genetics we're producing more lambs naturally from that from that increase in um you know, the genetic sort of performance of, of our breeding ewe flock, which has been quite significant. So I just wanted to touch on that and give you an indication of what we expect to happen then, certainly next year and then moving forwards as well. And we'll have an update on these figures in, in February next year. Sheep slaughter is a little bit the same. So that's our outlook for sheep slaughter. We forecast 7.8 million. We're at 7 million already. Um, sheep slaughter is 20% or 2 million head high year to date than what it was in, in official statistics than year-to-date volumes last year. So we've already killed an extra two million and the quarterly average for quarter four sheep slaughter sits around a touch over two million. So on that basis, you would assume we're gonna process over nine million sheep, mutton and, and weathers this year. And last year we were only at, what was that, 6.6. .6. So again, a two to two and a half million head increase in, in mutton slaughter in the space of 12 months. You couple that with a two to two and a half million head increase in lamb slaughter, if that doesn't tell you processes are coping with higher supply, I don't know what does. So it's a clear indication processes are managing, 
those numbers I spoke about, our weekly figures, you know, highest on record for Victoria, highest since December 2016. Processes are getting through these volumes and, and coping with that supply. I'll jump into cattle now. Um, it's a very similar story. So when you look at those five points, they're much the same as, as what I had for sheep. Supply, the herd's the highest it's been since 2014 at 28.7 million. Um, and much like sheep, none of us could have, could have sat here 12 months ago and said, you know, said restocker heifers are going to get to $1.20 in mid-October. No one could have picked that. Um, we knew prices were going to come back, but much like my point number three, I want to re reiterate how important that confidence factor or aspect is to why we're seeing this market soften. And it actually ties in quite nicely to point five, whereby the herd's actually a lot bigger than what people realise. And there's more numbers on farm. Producers don't need to jump into the market anymore and buy those young heifers to, to build breeding numbers. Because they've got those numbers available, it's reduced, because they've got those numbers available on farm, there's no necessity to jump into the market and compete on, on stock. And when you take that demand away from the producer level, which drove the market between 2020 and the end of last year, that lower demand is, is a contributing factor to why we're seeing, seeing prices get to where they were. But I think it's fair to say when you look at what rain's done, the restocker steer and heifer indicators have lifted 80 cents in a month. So we've all got some rain across the board. As I mentioned, like, you know, right up in Queensland through to Victoria and across in WA, you see restocker prices lift nearly a dollar within four weeks. It shows you how quickly confidence can turn around. But to get to where we are, confidence hasn't been there, which is why prices are now like that. Anywhere between 15 and 25% below 10 year averages, much like the lamb space, we see more upside to, um, to price, but we're still only gonna get back to 10 year averages with a 15 to 20% improvement. So yes, it's gonna take some time, but there are the fundamentals there, and I'll touch on it in a minute with the United States herd liquidation, which is gonna contribute quite heavily to seeing our cattle prices here domestically improve because of the, the reduced global supply of beef. So confidence is a major factor in that um, driving this market as well. And as I touched on with sheep, <coughs> pardon me, as I touched on with sheep, processes are coping with higher numbers. We've seen a 25% increase in the average weekly kill of cattle this year compared to last. So it equates to about 25,000 head extra that we're processing on average per week than what we were last year. So processes are dealing with these numbers, but labour does continue to be a factor in constraining our overall output or production. Um, as I mentioned, point five ties into that point three. The higher numbers on, on farm and the higher herd that we have reduces that demand or need to jump back in. We can, yeah. Yeah, you can work it out that way. Um, but we run a weekly slaughter report which captures anywhere between 80 and 85% of the processing numbers on average per week. And that's a voluntary report that processes choose to participate in, but it doesn't, we don't get that data in the sense like you're asking, were they from a sale yard? Were they directly consigned? We don't get that breakdown, but we do get their overall numbers that then goes out on a state basis, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so just wanted to bring that to your attention. When we consider we see more upside in this price outlook than we do downside, we've still got room to move in the sense that we're still operating, you know, 10 to 20% below 10-year averages. So it's going to take time, but that confidence factor and the seasonality, there's no question there's parts of, you know, particularly northern New South Wales, I call Tamworth home. It's been dry. Um, the hunter has been horrible. Like there's no question some of those, some of those areas are in drought. But again, much like sheep, on a widespread generalised nature, we're nowhere near in as bad situation or drought conditions as we were in 2019. And the reason why prices are lower, even though supply is lower now than what it was in 2019, is that confidence factor. Confidence has been drawn away from the producer because they were so badly burnt or so fearful of what 2017 to 19 sort of did. Um, and that reduction in confidence, when you take the producer out of it, it leaves the feedlots and the processes. And as supply continues to lift, 
that reduce competition in the market for similar animals that could go to a feedlot or a producer. When you take the producer out, naturally prices are, are going to be softer. This is just going to touch briefly on our forecast as well. These were released in June and we'll have an, another update with a full year um, out to 2026 forecast come in late January with an hour-long webinar as well. Um, as I mentioned, heard the highest in a decade uh, and, and more, more importantly, we're expecting a 17% lift or about a 1.1 million head increase in total cattle slaughter this year compared to last, a touch under 7 million, um, which is obviously quite a significant improvement. You've also got to look back and realise that 2021 and 2022 were consecutively the lowest slaughter rates of cattle in the country in 37 and 38 years respectively. So the lowest volume since the mid 80s. Um, so those two years were obviously very much reduced because producers were wanting to keep stock while seasonal conditions were good and it continued to rain, but we're seeing numbers improve at the minute. That 7 million head figure we've got forecast looks to be pretty close, um, if not a touch under, if we have a strong finish to the year. But that 7 million head will still be 650,000 head below the 10-year average. So 7 million this year, the 10-year average is 7.65. So even though, yes, we're seeing an improvement, we've still got a way to go before we get back to even long-term averages. But um, it is an improvement and processes are coping. Production, much like lambs, we're not going to reach records, but we're going to have a really strong improvement. And carcass weights and the investment producers have made in genetics and turning stock off faster at higher carcass weights or high weights is contributing quite heavily to why that we're seeing such a significant increase in total beef production. Yes, slaughter is going to rise by about a million head, but you can't understate how critical carcass weights are. We're feeding more cattle, which is contributing as well. Yes, we'll go and kill more grass-fed stock this year, in the quarter three September data, 70% of the cattle we processed were grass fed. Only 30% were grain fed. That's on a quarterly basis, the highest percentage of grass fed production since 2015, which is when the herd was also at this, at this size, which gives you an indication of, um, of how significant that grass fed aspect is and the higher numbers coming through the system but grain still plays a critical role and we expect the feedlots to really be quite important moving forwards as they always are because they're now an integral part of the supply chain. So feedlots still to remain really relevant, um, but that grass fed production will continue to increase. Cattle prices, much like lambs, it's going to take time, but there is upside. And I'm going to touch on the United States in a minute, but there's still a way to go before we get back to 10-year averages, but because of this dynamic in the United States with reduced beef production, it doesn't mean demand's going to go down. So there's still mouths to feed and we still need to feed the same, if not more, amount of people. With the United States production next year expected to go into um, a rebuild when their season turns around fully, that's going to give us the opportunity to capitalise on that, on that lower supply from them and they've taken us out of some key markets when our cattle prices were at record highs and the highest in the world to get back in there and, and control more of those markets. The demand isn't necessarily going to change. If anything, it'll increase. This is our June update for cattle slaughter. It shows you the next three years we're expecting a fairly significant increase. So the 2024 number back to 7.6 million, you'll remember I just mentioned 7.6 million just the 10 year average. So yes, we expect numbers to rise quite quickly and there is more than likely the potential that we'll, we'll revise that 7.6 million head figure for next year higher as processes continue to cope or continue to improve the efficiency of their labour um, force and they add more shifts, things like that. And we've already seen some processes across the country announce decisions to do that um, because they know cattle numbers are gonna come and they're gonna come quite significantly. That 8.35 million head figure is a lot more reflective of the cattle herd that we're getting to over the next 12 to 18 months. So killing 8.5 million is about what we did in 2019. It's about the same number. And that's a lot more reflective of, of, of a herd at 28.7 million by that stage. But as I say, we will revise these numbers and release a new set in 
in January next year, so, so keep an eye out for that. As I mentioned about not understating carcass weights or under, underestimating how important they can be, you'll see there in our model when we did this um, forecasting in June, we incorporated a drought period within 18 months into the model and that's what is why we're seeing carcass weights decline. They'll still remain, by 2025, we've got them down to 303 kilos. They're still 10 or 11 kilos above the 10 year average and about six or 8%, which is 25 kilos above the 20 year average. So yes, we expect carcass weights to fall, but when you consider them against long-term performance, they'll stay um, quite high. That production volume, as I said, like you look at those two years in 2021 and 22, how low they were, it looks like a significant increase, but when you consider how low we were, we're actually just probably jumping up to long-term averages. And by 2025, with carcass weight staying high, we are expecting record beef production. Just quickly, as I mentioned, um, slaughter volumes 28% or 25,000 head higher for cattle on average this year to last, which shows your processes are coping. Um, and the ABS data, we're higher by 20% to quarter three or nearly 800,000 head more or extra cattle we've killed this year compared to last as well. Um, production volumes mirroring it up by about 300,000 tonnes, which is fairly, fairly substantial in the space of 12 months. As I mentioned about the US, the chart on the left shows you how many females they're killing as a percentage of the total over the last, what, 10 years. So the US female kill rate is at record highs. You'll see the chart on the right, the yellow line is the 2023 volume. Slaughter rates on a weekly average or, or weekly have declined compared to last, but the US is still liquidating a significant amount of cattle. And what that's going to mean is their rebuild or the time it takes to get numbers back up will take a whole lot longer. So their cow numbers at the minute are the lowest since the 60s, over 55, 60 years. So this situation is going to take them a long time to get back, but the season's got to go with them as well. So that dynamic is going to provide us an opportunity. And as I mentioned about demand, it isn't going to fall. Demand's going to stay the same from those consumers who need to eat each day. With the US production declining, we are expecting that to play a significant role in why we're going to see cattle prices improve in 2024. We thought it might happen this year. It hasn't. They've just continued to kill a, a really large number of stock. The expectation is... You know, we can't predict the weather, but, you know, sort of by mid next year, we'd expect to turn around. The US has done exactly what Australia did in 2020. We still killed 7.2 or 3 million head of cattle. The reason being the market was rising. Producers wanted to offload stock and take an opportunity when prices were good so that they could capitalise on that and rebuild a balance sheet after feeding cattle for three years. So the US is doing the same thing and their cattle prices are already at record highs before they've gone into a full-blown rebuild. So it gives you an indication of how that is going to take some time to flow through to Australia. Yeah, so the question was how does the female kill rate compare to ours? Generally, they kill a lower number. So their rate um, in that bold and orange line, it's getting to about 54% on an annual average, it might be less, it might be 53, but ours was 59% in quarter four 2019. So ours was significantly higher, but for the US getting to 53%, that's astronomically high. Like it's the highest it's ever been for them. So it, it's a lot. And as I mentioned, their, their cow herd is 28 or 29 million. It's the lowest it's been since the 60s. So it's gonna take them a long time to rebuild those numbers. Finally, the um, goat update just quickly as well. Their rebuild's been stronger than, than probably sheep and, and cattle combined because of that gestation length and the ability to turn animals off so much faster. Their supply increase has been fairly substantial too. So our weekly goat or weekly slaughter volumes, which is voluntary, it's not a compulsory um, figure, it's up by nearly 60% or nearly 700,000 head year to date compared to last. Our Quarter three goat processing numbers are 80% or 320,000 head higher 
than the quarterly five-year average. So it shows you how many goats we're processing at the minute as well, and it's another indication, pardon me, that processes are coping with these higher numbers. Exports, much like, um, much like cattle, much like sheep, they're very, very strong at the minute. And we're actually seeing a real improvement in China and other countries outside of the United States, Taiwan, South Korea, etc. Finally, on the goat prices, they are much like the cattle and sheep markets, down, what do we got, 60% or nearly $3 a kilo. Goat prices moved first as well, which is something to remember. So about October last year, goat prices started to decline. They were the first ones to show challenges in the United States market because there was more domestic beef available, which meant there was reduced demand from the consumer over there, but they were the ones that started to decline first, which may give us an indication, and it's something I'm keeping an eye on moving forwards, is how goat prices perform when that US beef production declines as well, because there's still that consumer dynamic in the US that appreciate goat meat. We export between 50 and 55% of our total goat production to, to the States. So that consumer may move back into that space for goats because the US beef production's going down Retail prices, we don't know what they're going to do, but if there's lower supply, you would expect prices to change. That may provide some demand for goat meat um, and, and improve prices in turn. That was the statistic I was talking about, 80% or 320,000 head higher for Q3 this year compared to the five-year average. So we're processing, we process 700,000 head um, of goats. That was the highest it's been since early 2017. Export performance, as I just mentioned, it'll be the best year since 17, and um, mainland China, for example, because the price has allowed it, um, has allowed those Chinese price sensitive buyers or importers to step back into the market. We'll see record um, goat exports to China, despite the fact that we essentially exported zero last year. We're basically moving into record territory within 10 months. It'll beat the 2013 calendar year within 10 months. So it shows you China's a key aspect there. And I know there's always questions about the US, but our exports this year have been quite strong to go to other places too. So we are getting a bit of diversity and we are showing that we can export product to other countries and there is the demand there for, for goats. I just want to finish with three key takeaways to sum up this dynamic across sheep, cattle and goats. So as I mentioned, and I think it's quite clear, supply is, is going to stay high. We're expecting volumes to remain high. Supply of finished and young cattle, you know, finished lambs, mutton, it's all going to remain high. We're a decade and 15 year highs for the sheep and lamb, uh, sheep and cattle, herd and flock, sorry. So we expect that to, um, to remain that way. Confidence is king. The weather, we don't know what the weather's going to do, but you can see restock of cattle prices lifting a dollar within four weeks, it shows you confidence can return to the market very quickly. So moving forwards, prices will be determined obviously by the weather. We know that's the case, but I also want to reinforce the fact that this, this game is cyclical and livestock production is a long-term play. It's not something that happens overnight and we know we've been here before, probably not as bad as what we expected, but we know we've been here before and we know we'll get out of it. So it's cyclical, it takes time, but confidence, can play a major role in how we're seeing those prices change. It's clear, as I mentioned, the change in process at throughput this year, it's continuing to, to happen and it's continuing to work quite well. So we expect that to remain the same and we expect processing volumes to continue to increase in line with the high supply of physical animals. So I think that's a positive and we've got to, we've got to remember, say, um, beef, for example, 25,000 head on average per week more than last year. We expect that to continue to lift. So processes are coping with the numbers to the best of their ability and this supply is going to continue to flow, but confidence is king. And if we see this confidence in the outlook remain sort of firm, you, you know, restocker price is lifting a dollar because producers know they've got a couple of months of grass ahead of them. It can make a very, very big difference quickly to what we see change. You throw in the United States dynamic, the outlook to the end of next year is still optimistic. Our export volumes for beef are up 20%. Ram, uh, lamb exports will be records. Things will get better and it will all be okay. There's just some pain at the minute that people have dealt with, which I'm not questioning or understating, but you've got to be optimistic in what the outlook looks like. And this US dynamic is quite positive. There's demand for our product. Things are in good shape. So thanks for having me. Cheers.